pray, hope, and don't worry. A celebration of Padre Pio. On the 23rd of May, Pope John Paul came to pray and pay homage at the tomb of a man who has been called the greatest mystic of our century. A man who followed in the steps of St. Francis of Assisi, with whom he shared a nationality, a name, and a faith, and with whom he will perhaps share infinitely more. Because the man buried here surely deserved to join St. Francis in the company of saints. The Holy Father had come here to San Giovanni Rotondo twice before. He came when he was a simple priest from Rome and as a cardinal from Krakow. Today he comes as Christ's vicar on earth. Padre Pio, baptized Francesco, shared one great mystical phenomenon with St. Francis of Assisi, the stigmata. The image of Christ in his passion, his bleeding body bearing the five wounds, his head lacerated by the crown of thorns. The five wounds, collectively known as the stigmata, have, on very rare occasions, appeared on the bodies of living people, and the Catholic Church has acknowledged previous manifestations of this kind. However, very few men have suffered the agony of the stigmata in the complete form of the five wounds, in the hands, the feet, and the side. The first was St. Francis of Assisi, and nearly 700 years later, the same wounds were borne by Padre Pio, the first priest to receive the wounds of Christ on the cross. Here, in the village of Pietralcina, in the rugged south of Italy, he came into the world on May the 25th, 1887, in this small house. His parents, Grazio and Maria Forgioni, had married in the nearby church of St. Anne. And it was here, in this church, that their son Francesco experienced one of his earliest direct encounters with God. As a child of five, he had begun to experience ecstasies and also assaults from the devil. On one occasion, while quietly at prayer in St. Anne's, he had a vision of the Sacred Heart. He had already decided to offer his life to God and said that at that moment he felt hands upon his head, indicating that his offer had been accepted. One day, before setting off for America to find work in order to feed and educate his family, his father took him to a local shrine of St. Pellegrino. And there they witnessed a profoundly moving incident. The mother of a badly deformed child hurled her infant onto the altar, crying, If you cannot heal him, you must keep him. The child sat up and ran to his mother's arms, completely healed. Grazio Forgione wanted to hurry his son away, but Francesco remained praying. Francesco Forgione began his religious training at Morcone and also attended several other Franciscan novitiates. He was ordained in the year 1910 when he was 23 years old in the Cathedral of Benevento. The young friar was often ill 
he slipped into states of ecstasy which alarmed and worried his superiors. He fasted to extremes. He was subject to alarming temperatures, which were so high it is said they broke the thermometer. Concerned about his health, puzzled by his fevers, trances and visions, the friars sent him back to his own village of Pietrocina. countless hours in this squat tower, the Torretta, which his family owned, studying, praying, and in meditation. Sometimes he distanced himself for days and nights, staying in this lonely farm building in the midst of the countryside. Perhaps this long period of isolation from the life he had most hoped for was a preparation for the extraordinary years to follow. In September 1910, he had already begun to experience inexplicable pains in his hands. A year later, the young man wrote to his superior, Padre Benedetto, Yesterday evening something happened, which I can neither explain nor understand. In the center of the palms of my hands, a red patch appeared, accompanied by a sharp pain. I also feel some pain in the soles of my feet. Knowing full well what these pains foretold, he begged God to spare him the embarrassment, though not the pain, of the wounds. Apart from a brief spell in the Italian army in 1915, from which he was soon invalided out, he remained at his birthplace, Pietrocina, where the villagers had now erected a small chapel, enclosing the tree under which he had first felt the pains of the stigmata. But in 1916, in the hope that the change of climate would cure his acute chest trouble, he was sent to the isolated and inaccessible Franciscan friary at San Giovanni Rotondo, a town of no interest then, a place of eager pilgrimage now. The early intimations of suffering were shortly to become something much more. Padre Pio was soon to suffer pains that he would gladly endure, but a notoriety that he found hard to live with. The full and terrifying appearance of the stigmata occurred on the morning of September the 20th, 1918. Padre Pio was in the choir of the old church in San Giovanni Rotondo, having celebrated Mass. He described what happened thus. I yielded to a drowsiness similar to a sweet sleep, and during this I saw a mysterious person. His hands and feet and side were dripping with blood. This sight terrified me. The vision slowly disappeared, and I became aware that my hands, my feet, and my side were also dripping with blood. Padre Pio was 31 years old. Father Alessio was for a long time a close companion of Padre Pio and looked after him in his later years. This is the place where Padre Pio received the stigmata on the 28th September 1918. From this latter year, you can see that Padre Pio was praying here when he saw this crucifix alive, dripping blood. And in that moment, Padre Pio felt an extraordinary peace inside of himself and outside. And during this time, Padre Pio always saw the crucifix alive, dripping blood. 
And he said that when he came out of this trance, I would say, he realized that his hands, his feet, and his side were pierced like the crucifix. This is the very first photograph of his wounds. It was later witnessed by a notary. News of this astounding event slowly spread, and the ordinary people began coming to San Giovanni in large numbers to catch a glimpse of the stigmatized friar or to squeeze into the church to hear his mass. Understandably, perhaps, the attitude in the friary to the unique stigmatization of a young priest was one of extreme reservation. There was talk of transferring Padre Pio to another part of Italy, but the people of San Giovanni clamored for him to stay. There were even threats of violence. Eventually, something had to be done. A decision had to be made. Such notoriety can be an embarrassment rather than a blessing. In 1923, the Holy Office intervened with a series of measures. It declared that there were no signs of the supernatural in the case and ordered Padre Pio not to say Mass in public and to cease all written correspondence. When the decree was read to him, he said, God's will be done. So began the years of seclusion when Padre Pio became a priest without a congregation, a confessor unable to give absolution, a Christian without a spiritual director. He immersed himself totally in prayer and spiritual writing and reading and wrote the words Resta Con Me. Stay with me, Lord. Thou knowest how thee I can forget. Stay with me, Lord. Thou knowest without thy strength I fall. Stay with me, Lord, for without thee my fervor fails. Stay with me, Lord. Thou art my light, thou art my life. Some time passed before the ban was lifted. Pope Pius XI, on further examination of the facts, permitted Padre Pio to resume his ministry. Eventually, a larger church had to be built to accommodate the huge congregations made up of people who came from all over the world. The flow of pilgrims began again with renewed fervor. They came then, and still they come. Padre Pio often spent 12 to 18 hours a day in the confessional. Even so, so many people came that a wait of two or even three weeks was not unusual for visitors who wished to be absolved by this charismatic figure, who always tried to keep his hands covered or hidden. He knew when people were wasting his time, when they had come for the wrong reasons, and occasionally terminated a confession abruptly with the word, Basta! Enough! He could read your mind, your soul, and when God gave him the light to see the soul of a person, Padre Pio really, you know, would tell him or oh, hey, the, the sins, and also if sometimes they are not ready or they were not sincere in their confession, he would, you know, send them away without a solution. He was usually disarmingly simple and direct. Nothing could be more to the point than change your life. Or to someone who questioned the very existence of hell, you will believe it when you get there. He was capable, though, of remarkable insight. And there are many reports of his ability to read people's minds and their hearts. To know details of their lives and circumstances that he could not possibly even guess. Once, a woman was very surprised to be told that her penance, usually a prayer to be said in atonement for sin, was to go home and look in the well in her garden. As she did so, she saw the face of the son she had had aborted many years before. 
Joe Greco, now a great devotee of Padre Pio, met him in very unusual circumstances. After a dream in which he met Padre Pio on the road and asked him to save his father, Joe Greco's father suddenly recovered from a dangerous operation. Joe decided to go to San Giovanni to thank Padre Pio in person. He managed to get to confession after waiting four days. This is what did it, really. When he saw me, he said, well, your father's all right, then. Well, this shattered me, really, because I'd never been down in San Giovanni Rotondo before. I'd never been down that part of the world. Neither did I know anyone down there. And yet, I posed in my mind a question to him. I was saying, was it you? Was it you? And he replied, in the dream in the dream well i started shaking i was scared stiff to tell you the truth i said yes father in the dream father i told him my my sins and he gave me up uh, and he, before he gave me absolution he said to me now then there is something else you know i says well father i said i can't remember anything else and padre pio went on to describe an incident with a girl in the park when he was first in the army. Well, it all came back to me. I'd ho I wished the ground had have opened up and swallowed me up. I was so embarrassed. Oh dear, I said, yes, Father, it all comes back to me and I'm, I'm afraid I forgot to tell it in confession. I'm so ashamed. Well, he said, you've been carrying this sin around with you, he says, ever since 1941. And the place was Blackburn, to tell you the truth. And I got up to go. Part of here said, there is something else you've forget forgotten. And there was a slight smile on his face. I said, oh no, Father. Truly, there's nothing else that I can remember. I thought he was on about a sin, you know. And uh, he said, look in your pocket. So... <laughs> I brought my rosary beads out, I gave them to him, he blessed them, and he gave them back to me. And he, that was it. Those who knew Padre Pio talk with undying affection and admiration of a man who spent 50 years in extreme pain. For there is no doubt that he suffered real anguish from real wounds. The medical evidence of the stigmata, supplied by doctors who examined Padre Pio over the years, is impeccable. Dr. Luigi Romanelli, Dr. Giorgio Festa, and Padre Pio's personal physician, Dr. Sala, provided documentary evidence, as did many other independent medical experts, that the wounds were genuine and showed no signs of either healing or festering. Father Stefano is the superior of the Capuchin Friari at Pietrelcina where they have a room devoted to the many relics of Padre Pio's life. Of all the mementos we have here, the most important is Padre Pio's nightshirt, which, as you can see, is stained with his blood. How did this happen? We know that Padre Pio experienced the whole of Christ's passion, the scourging, the crowning with thorns, the wounds of the stigmata, and that in his own words, the occurred nearly every week over a period of many years. In spite of the continual pain, his contemporary, Padre Villani, once said, in the depths of his soul, he is the happiest man in the world. His attitude to life, in his own words, was always, pray, hope, and don't worry. Anxiety does not help at all, he would say. The good Lord will listen to your prayers. And yet this man, who was like no other man, for many years of his life rose at 2.30 a.m., went to the sacristy at four, said mass at five, a time decided after his period of rejection by Rome, when he had been ordered to say his mass as early as possible, hoping to discourage large congregations. But still they crowded to this center of worship and waited for an hour or more, even in bad weather, for the door to open. As he pleaded with God to forgive his people, there were so many to be remembered, so much to offer, that his mass could last for more than two hours. The stillness in the church was absolute.
As he reenacted the passion and death of Christ, Padre Pio became a man of sorrows, offering himself with Jesus for the salvation of the world. An eyewitness says, as he turned to give the last blessing, the peace of Christ descended on all present, and one realized that God in his love and mercy had given us this man of suffering in our lifetime to reenact before our eyes the mystery of our salvation. Because he offered to suffer like Christ before him to save souls, Padre Pio was granted what are known collectively as the gifts of the Spirit. By location, discernment, prophecy, conversion, healing, perfume and language. Father Joseph Pius came to the friary many years ago as an American tourist to see Padre Pio. He stayed to become a Franciscan friar. He actually, he actually understood languages he never knew. For instance, How do we know that? Uh, by, the, by the documented evidence in his life, for, for instance, after making me learn Italian, when I didn't understand why, um, he spoke to me in perfect English two months before he died. And had he not been known to speak in English before he knew? He had been known to hear a confession in English, uh, I think in 1927, but only that do I know about English? Then there's the story of the French pr prince uh, who came and, and spoke with Father Peel privately for 15 minutes and marveled at how perfectly an Italian could speak and pronounce French. The volume of his mail from all over the world was astounding. During the Second World War, he often gave families accurate reports on the fate of their menfolk who were away fighting. Many of his statements turned out to be prophetic. Mm -hmm. Father Peter Villani was brought up near San Giovanni and his mother was a great admirer of Padre Pio. His father had emigrated to America to find work. My mother, as usual, used to ask Padre Pio of everything she has to, had to do. So even that time she went and after her confession she said, Father, my son is asking me to go and see him. Can I go? What do you think? Oh, Padre Pio said, oh no, you can't. Why I can't, said my mother. Why I can't? Because she thought something had happened to me. So why I can't I see my son? Oh, well, you know, said Padre Pio. Your husband is dying. My mother had a shock because she said the letters she received from the state was very good. Good health, good job, no more. So because Padre Pio said no, she didn't come. And in fact, the day when she was due to come and see me, she received a telegram from the state to say yesterday your husband died from a mild coal accident. Uh, well, Some of the most extraordinary well. stories are about his bilocation, that is, his apparent ability to be in two places at once, on occasion even to hold up the passage of time. Father Villani and his mother would frequently walk 12 kilometers to San Giovanni from their village to attend Padre Pio's Mass. One day, after Mass, while Padre Pio was taking off his vestments, 
A friar told her that the friary had no bread. So she went all the way back to San Marco on foot. Collected the big loaf bread, about six, seven kilos, and put it on her head like our women did when carrying things. And back to San Giovanni to find Padre Pio in the middle of getting off his mass vestments. So by an extension of the power of bilocation, his mother traveled all that distance in less time than Padre Pio needed to take off his vestments. After he received the stigmata, he never left San Giovanni Rotondo. Yet there is an army of witnesses to swear that they saw him in many different parts of the world. And since his death, people are still unexpectedly finding themselves in his presence. Padre Pio's appearances of this kind are usually to people in need. Peter Barrett, in the army at the end of the war, found himself in San Giovanni and went to confession to Padre Pio and subsequently served his mass. Not long ago, in Greenwich Hospital, meeting the parents of a badly injured boy, he gave them a picture of Padre Pio and the message, pray, hope, and don't worry. Two weeks later, he met the parents of the injured boy, and they told him that their son was being discharged, fit, and well. The mother, very grateful, said, She said, I wonder, she said, could you give the, that priest, she said, or sincere thanks to his witcher. And I didn't want to embarrass her to say which priest, but I, I knew for a fact that there was, I was, on, I was on my own there. And she said, he was very like, she said, the priest that, on the picture that you showed me, she said. But she said, would you please give him our sincere thanks. The priest she saw was, of course, Padre Pio. Margaret Neal recently had this experience in San Giovanni. Our spiritual director on the pilgrimage coming round, giving each person the host. I saw him give my friend Kathleen the host. And then when he came to me, he passed just past me. And I looked forward and I saw this other priest walking forward with a chalice raised in his hand. I realized that it was Padre Pio himself who was giving me the communion. An American squadron leader claims that during the war, Padre Pio appeared before his plane in the sky above San Giovanni Rotondo and turned back the bombing raid. At the time, he had never even heard of Padre Pio and was only able to put a name to his vision when he saw Padre Pio in San Giovanni Rotondo several years later. Padre Pio was also reported to have been seen in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome on more than one occasion and to have visited the dying Vicar General of the Diocese of Salta in Uruguay. And testimonies of his power of healing of minds, bodies and souls Good morning, are too numerous to relate. My name is Sean Mulrain. I come from Derry City. This is my wife Anne. At this recent gathering in Ireland, Eileen Maguire talked about some of them. We have instances that are not explainable, such as, for example, Sean and Anne Mulrine in Northern Ireland. Sean and Anne, uh, Anne was expecting twins, and she had a very serious brain hemorrhage. And her husband prayed daily. Clinically, she was dead. She was placed on a life support machine. Her husband stayed at her side, continuously praying to Padre Pio. And on one occasion, the mitten was brought. Anne was blessed with the mitten of Padre Pio and for the first time after weeks on a life support machine she moved her hands and from there perhaps Sean could continue to tell you the story. So I went to see the surgeons and they sat down, three of them, and they said to me, Mr. Mulrine, the operation is over. It is or it has been our opinion a miracle that we were able to keep your two unborn children inside your wife's womb while such a long and tedious operation went on. She walked away from the hospital, perfect, and left her sticks behind her. And twins were born, and she is now mother of four children and perfect. Right. Yeah. 
Vera Calandra, here seen at the foot of Padre Pio's statue in San Giovanni Rotondo, is a leading worker in the cause of Padre Pio in America, and she tells us how she came to invoke Padre Pio's help. How we came into my life certainly was a gift from Providence, and I can look back now at the last 20 years, and we do wonder in the household how we would have been able to survive the crosses that have come our way without the assistance and the intervention of Padre Pio because our daughter was at the brink of death. So after asking Padre Pio's intercession and sending a telegram here to the monastery, I actually had an experience in my home where Padre Pio asked me to come and to bring my little girl to him, but that I must not delay, that I would have to come immediately. There was always someone there to lend a helping hand. We saw Padre Pio, we were blessed by him, we were able to kiss his gloved hand, and we returned to the United States. My daughter showed tremendous improvement from that point on, and Padre Pio died just a couple of weeks afterwards. She is now called the amazing young lady. She celebrated her 21st birthday just a matter of weeks ago. My daughter is alive every day, so I must do something each day in the name of Padre Pio. And that is when we talked about starting our own prayer group in my parish and from the prayer group with the demand of the people to know more about Padre Pio is when we started our center, the office that would distribute literature throughout the United States. But Padre Pio works in many ways. There are physical healings and there are spiritual healings. And Bella will fill you in on a spiritual healing. Uh, ten months ago we got word from Germany that my brother was very ill with cancer. And she was even more worried to hear that he had given up the practice of his religion. She sent him leaflets with information on Padre Pio, together with scented rosary beads from San Giovanni. My brother, I tried to, in, to talk to him in February about Padre Pio, and he got actually very angry with me. He told me I was a fanatic, and he said, if you want me to know anything about Padre Pio, tell him to give me direct contact. And I said, well, John, someday, if that's what you want, the Padre will do that for you. And I do believe that the Padre was with him when he died. I believe that. What we are saying, it was through the intercession of Padre Pio that my brother received the last rites of the church before he died. Well, they said Joe Greco also had great so faith in the spiritual power of Padre Pio. What are we going to do, Father, when you pass away? You're getting on a bit, you know. And uh, he said, I shall do more in heaven, he said, than ever I shall be able to do on earth, he said. And not one of my, sp I shall never enter heaven, he said, or rest until all of my spiritual children are in heaven. That's right. And that is exactly as it's happened to me. It helps to understand Padre Pio's willingness to suffer as Christ himself had suffered, to remember that as a young man he was sent a vision of a majestic figure of rare beauty, radiant as the sun, in the midst of two huge armies, the forces of good and evil. Throughout his life he continually suffered physical encounters with the devil, after which he was left exhausted and bleeding. Sometimes at night, sounds of violent struggle were heard coming from his cell. He even showed signs of having been physically assaulted, and on one occasion was so badly injured he had to spend several days in bed. One day he was in the choir loft praying, and uh, when he saw so many devils, and they started to shout at him to make noisy, and. Uh, Paddy Bill said to them, I know you a job, I don't care about you. So when they heard that, they threw him on the floor and they started to kick him, slap him, punch him. And Paddy Bill felt that they would kill him. So he called, he said, all the saints in heaven to help me, but no one came to help me. Then I called my guardian angel, and my guardian angel didn't come immediately. He delayed. 
When he arrived, instead of chasing the devils away from me, he started to fly around me, singing beautiful hymns. Now, dear friends, you think about Padre Pio on the floor, beaten to death by the devils, and the guardian angel flying around, uh, uh, around him. He said, finally, when I got up, I gave him a good scold. And to punish him, I didn't look in his face. But then my guardian angel, like a little boy who had done something wrong, he followed me, he asked me forgiveness, and he promised me that he would never do that again. During his ecstasies, he spoke with Our Lady, with Jesus, and his own guardian angel in short, broken sentences. It was said, charmingly, that he sounded as though he was chatting in a family group. He spoke also with holy souls, the church's name for those of its departed brothers on their way through the pains of purgatory to their eternal reward in heaven. When he heard news of one of his brother friar's death, he began to pray for him and was astonished to see him at the doorway. This confrere said, Oh, hello, Father, how are you? They told me you were dead. And the Father said, Oh, yes, I am. Please pray for me. Just like that. Padre Bio was praying here in the choir loft and he to us around midnight when he had the candlesticks on the main altar downstairs <coughs> moving and falling. <coughs> and the, he looked down and he saw a small novice. And this novice looked up and said to Padre Pio, I am doing here my purgatory because when I was a novice, I was appointed here to clean the altar of the blessed sacrament, but I didn't do my job well. Padre Pio thought he was seeing a vision, you know, he was an hallucination. And he went downstairs and he really found on the floor candlesticks and flowers. He had a special devotion to the unique shrine in the remote hill town of Monte San Angelo. Where else would someone who fought so often with the devil send people who were troubled or possessed by evil spirits, but to the church here, a shrine dedicated to the Archangel Michael, who is invariably depicted overcoming the powers of darkness. This subterranean shrine on the cliff of the Gargano has a deep stairway that leads to an underground church dating from the 4th century where the instruments of crucifixion are depicted. It is not surprising to learn that St. Francis of Assisi also came here on pilgrimage and many popes and princes of Europe came, often barefoot, as an act of humility. and knelt here to pray for the protection of St. Michael. Pope John Paul II came to pay a pastoral visit to this area, this shrine was the scene of deep prayer. Perhaps the Holy Father remembered his first meeting with this charismatic friar when he visited so many years before as a student. As we have heard, Padre Pio, who suffered illnesses, fevers, constant headaches, the pain of the stigmata and physical assaults from the devil was nevertheless a cheerful, often humorous man, even when the added burden of severe arthritis, combined with the pain of his pierced feet, confined him to a wheelchair. That he was a joyful man, he was full of joy, full of enthusiasm. He, when we were 
boys, children. We stayed with Padre Pio after Mass and he sat with us, amongst us, telling stories, cracking jokes, and it was, it was really delicious to be with him. Um, he used to tell a story about a farmer who was very attracted by a train going through the countryside in the very early years uh, of, of trains in Italy. And uh, on a free day, the farmer went off to have a ride on this new contraption, you see. There's a whole scene, I can't do it like Father Pio did it, at the window, at the window of the ticket taker, uh, not the ticket taker, the, the ticket seller. Uh, where are you going, sir? I said, why don't you mind your own business? Um, uh, do you want to return tickets, sir? I, I think you're very nosy. Anyway, they finally got the chap on the train. He sat down in front of a priest who was on to him immediately. And with that, the train went into a long, dark tunnel. The farmer got a bit scared. And he said, Father, where are we going? And the priest said, we're going to hell. And the farmer chirped back and said, I don't care. I have a return ticket. <laughs> I said, but the, he, he would tell these jokes. He would love to listen to jokes. He would, uh, he would never miss a recreation. Never. He derived great strength from his devotion to Mary, the mother of God. Father Gerardo, who is the vice postulator for the cause of the beatification of Padre Pio, is telling the story of the statue of Our Lady of Fatima, which was brought to San Giovanni Rotondo in August 1959 during its tour of Italy. It was as though the Heavenly Mother was paying a visit to her beloved son Padre Pio. By coincidence, Padre Pio had been seriously ill with pleurisy since March of that year. So ill, he could not even say Mass, only receive Holy Communion. He had, however, been leading a special nine days of prayer in preparation for the arrival of the statue. On the evening of the 5th of August, the statue arrived, and the next morning, pulling all his failing strength together, Padre Pio managed to get down to the church where he remained for a considerable time in silent prayer in front of the statue. As the statue was being removed by helicopter the following day, Padre Pio asked to be taken to the window in the choir so that he might see it flying past. As it did, he was heard to say, My beautiful Madonna, you found me ill and you are going away leaving me ill. At that, he felt a great shiver run through his body, and at that very moment, his illness was cured. In fact, he was as well as he had ever been, and immediately resumed the saying of Mass, hearing confessions, and all other priestly duties. He lived with a rosary in his hands. The rosary is the weapon against evil, he often said. And of Our Lady, she treats me as if I were her only child on the face of the earth. She comes to me whenever I need her. An expression of gratitude and joy, not of conceit. The day before his death, he insisted, love the Blessed Virgin and make her loved. Always say the rosary. His last word on earth was Maria. On September the 20th, 1968, a hundred thousand pilgrims gathered in San Giovanni for the 50th anniversary of Padre Pio's receiving the stigmata. Many of the visitors belonged to the prayer groups, which had grown spontaneously in many countries from his constant exhortations to prayer. There are now over 2,000 such groups throughout the world. That day, in spite of his frailty, he said the Mass that proved to be his last. 
He could hardly breathe or reach the altar. When he turned to leave, he almost fell. In the evening, he asked to be helped to the window to greet once more the visitors to San Giovanni. He waved his white handkerchief. Then the shutters were closed forever. Father Pellegrino was with Padre Pio on the night he died and is here telling Father Pius about it. I went to Padre Pio's cell about 8.30 or 9 p.m. and stayed with him for the rest of his time on earth. Occasionally, I wiped away his tears. Around midnight, he said, sit down beside me, please, and he began to tremble like a child. He continually asked the time, as though he had an appointment to keep. At 1 a.m., he asked to make his confession and renewed his religious vows, which end with the words, if you abide by this on behalf of God, I promise you eternal life. At this, he seemed a little better, got up, washed his face, and went to the window, asking if the sky was studded with stars. He looked 20 years younger all of a sudden. After five minutes, he his wheelchair, started to perspire very heavily in a cold sweat, and his lips turned blue. He asked for the wheelchair to be removed, as though he had no further use for it, and began to say continuously, Jesu Maria, looking straight ahead, he said, what is that? A photo of your mother, I replied. But I see two mothers, he said. Thinking his sight was failing, I explained that there were other photos too, including his American friend Mary, who had recently died. I see those clearly, he said yet still see two mothers. Again, he started to repeat, Jesu Maria. As I made to leave his cell for assistance, he called me back, saying, do not trouble anyone else. I insisted, however, and went to find Father Joseph Pius and asked him to get his doctor, Dr. Sala. Dr. Sala and his colleagues arrived, and I went to bring the other friars. Padre Pio continued to repeat, Jesu Maria, right up to his last breath when at 2.30 a.m. he gently bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The wounds of his feet, hands and sides had begun to heal during the recent months. During that last mass, the healing became complete. His dead body showed not a single scar or mark. He was already sharing his Saviour's resurrection. Padre Pio was buried in this tomb, in the new, larger church, a tomb finished only a few days previously, surrounded by the thousands of pilgrims who were still in San Giovanni. How wonderfully God seems to arrange these things. As a young friar, walking in the fields surrounding Pietrelcina, 
He had prophesied that they would one day be filled with the odor of incense and the chanting of monks. On that spot, a seminary was built 30 years later, through the generosity of an American lady, Mary Pyle, who helped with English-speaking pilgrims for many years in her house near the friary. Her assistant, Carmilla, will always remember what Padre Pio said to her shortly before his death. Carmela is saying that she asked Padre Pio what they would do after he had gone. Padre Pio said, go on as you have done before, but remember, I can do much more for all of you from heaven than I can here on earth. In his lifetime, he heard countless confessions and is truly called the Padre of the Confessional. But as he said to Carmela, his real work would begin after his death. He had planned a vast and much needed hospital, which was completed in his lifetime. Other works include a home for sick priests, a home for spastics, and a spectacular way of the cross was constructed. Here, he is depicted as Simon of Cyrene, the man taken from the crowd to help bear Christ's cross to Calvary. Padre Gerardo described Padre Pio as the greatest mystic of our century. At a Padre Pio celebration day in Ireland, Father Jack McCardle had this to say. Padre Pio wasn't defending what he was saying, he proclaimed it and you got free to walk away. When you stop defending it, they'll stop attacking it. And I couldn't imagine a young person, in person, uh, contradicting Padre Pio. He may have to walk away eventually, because he may not be able to take it. But uh, he's going to be forced to a decision, to a response. That he was really a man of God. You could feel God's presence in that man. Non vi lascerò orfani, ritornerò da voi. Il tempo pasquale, cari fratelli e sorelle di San Giovanni Rotondo. On the occasion of his visit to San Giovanni Rotondo in 1987, the Holy Father said, I wish to thank the Lord with you for having given Padre Pio to this generation in this very tormented century. In his love for God and for his brothers, he is a sign of great hope, and he invites us all not to leave him alone in this mission of charity.
The cause of Padre Pio's beatification was officially opened in 1983, the decree being signed by Pope John Paul II, who had long been a devotee of the man baptized Francesco Forgione. Pray, hope, and don't worry.